Thanks a lot, Brandon. Um, this is mostly a set of slides. We'll see if there's time for some demo at the end about the propeller component. The propeller was added a while ago to capture the design intent in the way that for people who design and work with propellers all the time work. This component can also be used for a rotor on a helicopter or a VTOL vehicle, although most of the parameters and most things are set up really from the perspective of a propeller. And if you are designing uh, fully articulated helicopter rotors, then you're going to find the the description of the hub perhaps lacking and uh, we don't really have that kind of articulation represented in here so it's mostly for propellers but can obviously be used for rotors uh, as needed uh, like every component the uh, the propeller starts off with the design tab where there's control of the mode that the prop is shown in then some general design parameters some of which are explanatory some of which i'll detail and then actually an output section where we talk about some of the propeller metrics that are calculated on the fly for your model. To start with the propeller mode up at the top, you get three choices. You can either show it a propeller as blades, as both, or as a disc. And you'll notice here with the X57 model, we've represented, we're showing all of these propellers as blades where we're rendering and modeling every blade individually. On the far right, we're ignoring the blades, we're dropping them and we're just showing an actuator disc. So we have the diameter and position represented in orientation. Um, and that shows the, the arc of movement for each of those props. And then in both mode, we draw both the disc and the blades. If you use disc only mode, then your updates and your refreshes are going to be much, much faster. So I certainly recommend if you're in a model and you have a complex combination of rotors and not rotors, you probably want to leave it in disk mode most of the time and only switch it to blade when you need that. Now, this isn't just about visualization. This representation mode also determines what goes to any sort of analysis or export. So when you export the geometry, if only the blades are being shown, then the disk is not going to be exported to that geometry and is not going to be communicated to that analysis. Likewise, if you're in actuator disk mode only, then the blades are not going to go to that geometry. They're not gonna end up in the CAD file. They're not gonna to go to that analysis. And in both, then both are gonna to go to whatever analysis or whatever export file. So just know that what you see on screen is what you're gonna get in your analysis or in your export. Now I'm going to skip diameter and number of blades and the rotation because I think that those are pretty obvious and, and self-explanatory. There is some, some need to talk about what's going on with beta 3.4 and feather angle. And what we have here is in, in practice, many propellers when they talk about, oh, when they talk about a pitch setting, uh, especially when it's reported back to a pilot's interface or, a, or an operating handbook. They'll talk about the angle of the pitch on a variable pitch prop at this point in time at the three quarters radius location at 75% of R over R. And so that's what we're talking about when we say beta 3.4. That's the beta angle, that's the pitch angle at three quarters of the blade. And this is different from just the angle at three quarters of the blade, because later on when we talk about the twist distribution, you'll see that this blade, which starts at 20% uh, 20, 20 at the root of the R over R and goes out to the tip at one, it varies in angle from about, oh, let's call it 47 degrees down to about 13 degrees and along this curve such that at 75, percent of the blade were at 20 degrees and so the twist angle varies out along the blade and you'll notice never on this curve does it go to zero so this is very common for a propeller a way of specifying a prop in that its twist is in some nominal case say a cruise situation it never crosses zero but the reference point that's commonly used is this three quarters location so in this case, this prop, its twist distribution is 20 degrees at 75% of the blade. And so the mathematical relationship is just beta 3, 4 
is equal to the twist at 75%, 3, 4, plus the feather angle. So if you want to specify the twist angle, the beta, the, the feathering of your blade in terms of beta 3, 4, click this yellow button and then dial it in. We will do the math to calculate the required rotation to put the blade in that position. If you would rather work in an absolute sense and not do this math and just rotate the blade about some basal coordinate system, then just click the feather button and choose this yellow button. It'll turn off beta 34. It'll switch it to feather mode and then it'll rotate that. Either way, the opposite value will be calculated on the fly. So if you're in feather mode, the beta 3.4 will be calculated on the fly. And likewise, if you're in beta mode, the feather angle will be calculated on the fly and reported in this box. The next option down the list is pre-cone. This is sort of a side view of a prop here on the left. I've tried to come and show the disc and the blades, but we're almost looking down across the plane of the disc. And you can see that with zero pre-cone, the blades are in the plane of the disc. But then with 10 degrees pre-cone, they're coning forward. They're being pulled forward in the thrust direction. Um, and they're rotating about the rotation axis. And they cone forward just at 10 degrees. And pre-cone can be in both props and rotors as a standard uh, deflection, a simple deflection that we have. Next on the list is the construction line specified in X over C. And the default is 0.5, which is this middle case. And you can see that with this kind of a, a curved chord distribution, but with a X over C construct, X over C of 0.5, you get a straight mid chord line. Whereas if you change it to 1.0, then these blades are going to be straight about the trailing edge. Or 0.0, .0 they're actually straight about the leading edge. And so the construction X over C is the straight line about which the plan form is developed. So when you twist a blade or you talk about your cord being developed, uh, these things are all done about the construction X over C line. We then have some control over the location of the feather axis. We have two options, feather axis and feather offset. Looking at a top view of a rotor or a front view here, you'll see that with axis of 0.5 and offset of zero, puts that rotation axis right down the middle of the blade with no offset. The, the feather axis goes right through the center of rotation. You can shift the blades about that axis, so the offset stays zero, so the rotation axis still comes to the center of rotation, but the blade shifts so that at 0.25, they're now rotating about the quarter cord of each blade. Or you can use these in offsetting ways to create a result like at the bottom. So this together, these control the location of the feather axis on the blade through axis and the, the location relative to the rotation axis, the offset. Here down at the bottom, we actually calculate some outputs. And in VSP, you'll notice there's sometimes these kinds of boxes with a a slightly blue background. And these are things that are output. They're calculated on the fly, but they're actually available as PARMs. So you can use them in linking, you can access them through the API, you can do that kind of a thing with them. We'll, we'll talk some more about that later. But in this case, there's lots of things that propeller and rotor people use to talk about their props and their rotors. And we just calculate those on the fly based on the geometry as a, as a courtesy. <laughs> so, for propellers, they often work in terms of activity factor, which is sort of like a version of aspect ratio, and also integrated design lift coefficient. So activity factor and CLI are calculated there. Activity factor, you have to specify where the hub is in terms of where you begin your integral. And so that's what this R0 parameter does. The typical definitions are either 15 or 20% of the blade R over R. And the default there is 20%. If you're a rotor person, then you often work in terms of the, the average cord or the solidity, and you may work in terms of the geometric average, the thrust weighted average, or the power weighted average. And so the power weighted cord, thrust weighted cord, and solidity are all output here in these boxes. And this is always up to date with the rest of the geometry of your model. Um, and this is a per blade cord and a per blade solidity. 
I believe. I'd have to double check that. They might be, we might multiply them by three, but I'll double check that. One of the really cool things about the prop component <clears throat> is that unlike the wing, where you work in terms of a section from root to tip, you instead are specifying smooth, continuous curves of the different plan form parameters. And so things like your chord is determined by a smooth curve from root to tip. Your T over C is a smooth curve. Your twist angle is a smooth curve. And you're even to the point of your design integrated lift coefficient, CLI, is a smooth curve. Um, and then you can control these curves in many, many ways. Uh, there is some limitation. The CLI in, can only be used for airflow types that we have analytical definitions of. And we can really only use it when in a span of the of the prop where the where the blade is bounded by the same airfoil type. So the rule that comes out of this is for a propeller, you really want to use as few exec types as possible, and you want to specify them in as few locations as possible. So ideally, only two, one at the root and one at the tip. Um, sometimes there's reasons to go to three, maybe even four. The only exception to this is if you're using file airfoils, um, but I'd really recommend you don't do that on props because there's so much power that comes out of being able to do this as it is. There's a lot going on for the blade curve control, but you come to the blade tab. Up at the top, there's a selector for which curve you're going to be working on. Right now it's showing cord. And then there's a control for the type. Is it a linear interpolation or a cubic? And we'll talk more about that. Then we have a nice big window for the interactive curve editor where you can actually drag and drop the control points around to can channel that shape. You have some options for splitting a curve to basically insert more control points without changing the shape so that if you want to do local refinement, you can do that. Or likewise, you can delete control points. If you've if there's too many specified, then you can go through and you can you can uh, you can thin the crop. Down at the bottom, there's a fairly complex looking GUI. It's actually simple in practice for editing the control points where you can go through and you can, if you don't want to just drag and drop in precisely, but you want to very precisely control the numeric values of control points, you can type those values in there. And over at the very right of that, there's an option where you can enforce continuity on some of these types so that if you know you want a particular control point to be smooth, you can click that G1 button to force it to be smooth. Now, the different plan form curves, there's a lot of curves that you can edit. Chord, twist, rake, skew, sweep, axial, tangential, thickness, and CLI. So there's a lot going on here. All of them that reflect the plan form are, again, this is out the distribution of a blade. They're described here in this chart. So the gray reference axes show that this is a blade section somewhere out the blade, say at, at the middle of the blade at 0.5. This shows the direction of rotation for the blade, and this direction is the general direction of thrust. To give that reference, twist is measured positive up from rotation. So this airfoil is shown twisted up about 20 some degrees. Um, in this sense, the cord is the obvious definition. It's the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the blade. The axial direction is in the direction opposite thrust. Rake and, and tangential is in the direction opposite rotation. And axial tangential are a pair that are orthogonal to one another. Um, sometimes propellers are instead described in terms of rake and skew. And so rake and skew are very similar to axial and tangential, but instead of being sort of aligned with the thrust and rotation directions, they're actually aligned with the cord and normal to the cord. So rake is, move, is normal to the cord, uh, moving in a down direction, and skew is parallel to the cord. And you'll particularly find that in uh, certainly in marine propellers, they're described almost entirely in terms of that propeller having rake and skew. Uh, whereas some other tools will will use the axial and tangential directions. We also have sweep, 
which is very similar to tangential, but instead of being specified as a as a fraction of the radius as a linear dimension, it's an angular deflection. And so we have sweep as an angle that stays in the plane. It stays in this rotation disk. And we'll talk a little bit more about how it's different from tangential in another slide. My general recommendation is to avoid using redundant controls. If you're going to use axial and tangential, then you probably want to avoid rake and skew and just set them to zero and entirely use axial and tangential. On the other hand, if you're the kind of person who likes to use rake and skew, then use rake and skew, but then don't use axial and tangential. Mathematically, VSP will let you use both of them, but you're just going to get really, really confused. So I recommend you use one, not both. This section, again, it's a sectional view from root to tip. A little bit more on the difference between sweep and skew and rotation. Here we're looking from the rear, we're looking forward, so we're behind a prop looking forward. This is a default prop that rotates clockwise. In this case, sweep is going to move this section. If you sweep the tip section, it's going to move it along the arc of rotation, right? It's, it's, it's opposite the direction of rotation for positive sweep, but it's going to sweep that back and what you're going to find is that, of course, the, the real developed disk and the actual radius will not change with sweep. That, that'll that stay the same. However, both skew and tangential are more of a shear, and they translate this section in this vertical, what here's drawn as vertical direction. And so they will actually change the true diameter of the blades. Um, and they we don't update the disc and we don't update the diameter uh, parameter, but they will change the actual real diameter of the blade. So be careful with that. You can, you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble with extreme values of skew and tangential. In a similar manner, rake and axial actually uh, move the blade section in a, in a linear way like skew and tangential. In this case, it would be in and out of the, the, the plane of the screen. Um, they don't change the diameter because the diameter is still the, of the projected disc, but they do change the blade length. You have the ability to control the curve type up here. And if you click the pull down menu, you'll see four choices, linear, P-chip, cubic bezier, and approximate cubic bezier. Um, and there's reasons to use all of these. Um, first linear, it's extremely simple and obviously, and it's the perfect thing you want to do if you just want to do linear taper or linear twist, certainly as a starting point for design, just specify the start and end point and go with linear. P-chip <clears throat> is a piecewise cubic kermite interpolating polynomial, um, and it's this nice smooth curve. When you do a BEM file import, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, that's the default. It reads in all of your points along the blade and it fits a P-chip to them. It's a little not intuitive making changes to a P-chip. If you've got many control points in a P-chip and you, and you go to click and drag on one of the intermediate control points, you can get some ringing and some non-intuitive behavior. So that's not the one I like the most. Cubic Bezier, on the other hand, is the most intuitive when you have smooth curves. Um, this is what's shown here at the right, where you have a central control point, and then you're controlling the slope to the left and the right. And it, you can get a very intuitive, very smooth control with just a very small number of control points. So that's the one I recommend if you have a smooth distribution. There's this option to a, do an approximate cubic bezier. And what this does is it takes whatever you have, which could be a cubic bezier with many, many control points, or it could be a P-chip with many, many control points. And first, you choose approximate cubic bezier from the pull down, and then you click the button, convert to. So you go one, two. When you click the convert the button, what it's going to do is it's going to approximate your curve with a cubic bezier with fewer control points, and then it's going to change that mode to a cubic bezier. So this is a great thing to use after you do a BEM import, and you've got just sometimes a ridiculous number of control points, and your model's really, really slow you do this approximate cubic bezier and it's going to be better. Um, curve editing in general in this drag and drop area, it's pretty intuitive. Um, 
One really cool thing is the model does not update until you release the control point. So if you grab this green dot or you grab this black dot, you can move it around and you see what's going to happen to the distribution on this screen. And it doesn't update the whole model until you let go. If you want to split a curve, you use this row. You can either dial in where you want to split it in terms of R over R, or you can do it with a click to pick where you click this split pick button. And then the next place you click, it'll split it nearest the mouse point. So you can just click to, to split. And likewise for deleting, you can either choose by index, you can roll through this and the little yellow box will move and tell you which point. And then when you delete, and you hit this delete button, it'll obviously delete it. Or if you wanna to click to delete, you can click the del pick and then the next one you click on, it'll delete. Down here at the bottom, you can adjust all these things precisely with just a regular input that any like any other VSP component. And things that you can't change due to the math and whatever's being done will always be grayed out. So things you can't change will be grayed out. Things you can are white and bright. And uh, if you want to set that G1 continuity, click the box and some other things will gray out. On the XSEC tab, it's almost identical to that for a wing. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. There is a There are a couple of tricks. Um, if you want to change the hub cutout, the root section of a prop blade, the way you do that is you come to the zeroth X section and you change its radius. Um, so you change the zeroth section R over R to change that hub cutout. That one's tricky. People miss that one a lot. In general here, you want to use as few as possible. I'm very strict on this. Ideally, two. And two is sufficient in almost all circumstances. And you're going to use that if you have a a prop with blades all of the same family. Three is what I would go to if I had a, a circular cuff for a variable pitch blade or maybe an elliptical cuff that then transitions to a single blade type all the way out. And maybe four if I knew that the root section was one blade type and the tip was another and then there was a distinct area in between where things were transitioning. So there's really again as few as possible um, don't don't go crazy here because it's it doesn't make sense in a prop. A couple of exceptions. If you're using file airfoils or CST airfoils, you may want to you could use more. But both of these are kind of clunky and awkward with the propeller. It's not ideal. And so for a prop, I really recommend you use the analytical types and you use as few of them as possible. The modify tab is identical to the wing modify controls. It allows you to tweak things up here at the top, and you generally won't use this for a, for a prop, the shift rotate scale. Um, if you do want to blunt a trailing edge or modify the trailing edge to be rounded or something like that, these things work. And what you'll find is it should be really smart in that if you specify a blunted trailing edge of a quarter inch thickness at, or one centimeter thickness at the root and at the tip as dimensional thicknesses, even though the cords are different and vary along the blade, it should figure that out and keep a constant thickness all along. So uh, it generally should do what you want it to do in that case. The more tab um, includes folding control as well as tip treatment. The, the folding control allows you to put in a folding prop where it can either fold like a, a model airplane propeller that goes back along uh, along the body. It can fold like a STEMI S10 motor glider that folds in the plane of rotation, or you can do a complex fold like the folding props that Brandon designed on the X57. Um, you have to you get to set the folding axis, both its position and its direction. Um, so a, a vector and a location as well as the angle, and all those are set with these parameters up here at the top. I do want to point out there's a couple of icons on a prop um, that you may or may not have noticed. At the center of a prop, there's a vector showing the, the thrust direction and as well as the rotation direction for positive rotation. Similarly, for the fold axis, there's a line showing the fold axis and the direction for where that fold is. So as you change these fold parameters, this, this icon will move around to show you where it's going to fold about. Below that, the tip treatment is identical to the way a wing tip is treatment is controlled in terms of rounded or flat tips. So that should be very familiar. Um, and likewise, the tessellation control for clustering 
should be very familiar. Clustering is controlled over an entire prop. It's not section by section. It's the entire thing at once, which is generally pretty nice. The resolution itself is on the on the general tab. On the gen tab, the numu and numw control that overall tessellation resolution on the on a on a prop. Propellers have the neat ability to do a, a boundary element method style file for both import and export. Um, it's not in a format that exactly goes into any particular BEM code. The idea is that this file just control contains the information that a BEM code would need in a very simple file format to work with. So you should be able to convert it to whatever your favorite BEM is, whether it's something you've implemented in MATLAB or whether you're using Xroder or QProp or OpenBEMT or whether you're just doing a spreadsheet. The way you get to it is you go to the file menu and then you click export. You then, um, I don't know why this is identical to similar wind controls because that's nonsense. Um, but you go to export, the export menu pops up, you choose blade element, and that'll pop up. And if you have multiple props, you choose which prop you want to export. So one, two, three, you say, okay, there'll be a file display, you give it a name and you move on. And it'll dump out a file that looks approximately like this as a BEM file. There's some information up at the top that's just sort of general information about a BEM file. The number of sections is determined by numu. Then it's going to have a table where it specifies all of the blade plan form curves at that numu, so in this case, 66 points. And then after that, it's going to dump out the airfoil coordinates at all 66 stations. So whatever those airfoils that get developed and get interpolated uh, are, they're going to get dumped out here. Um, so that's a big, long file. We can not only export that file, we can also import a BEM file. Again, you go to file, import, choose the blade element, a file chooser, you choose the file and you import it. There's a couple of notes here. When you import that file, we're going to ignore those airfoil coordinates, those airfoil ordinates. So if you're making your own, say you're writing a BEM file in MATLAB or in your spreadsheet, you just come down to here and you stop before the airfoils. There's no point in going further. And that'll read in your blade plan form and get you a nice blade to start with. Um, all the curves from that distribution are set up with P-chip and a point at each station. So in this case, if there were 66 lines, that's way too many. You don't want that many on import. You would have 66 points in every single one of these curves, and they would all be P-chip. Um, that's why I recommend after you import from a BEM file, you use the approximate Bez cubic Bezier to simplify those curves and get rid of a lot of those redundant points. So it's it will be very overdefined when you import it. It will be slow until you clean it up. If you have 66 points on all of those curves, it's going to be ridiculously slow. Even after you clean it up, propeller is slow. It's a complicated com component. I know that. But uh, definitely don't shoot yourself in the foot with an overdefined uh, thing. And uh, I believe that's the last of it. And we're basically down to the final minute. So I'll try and answer some questions through chat, but I don't think that we're going to have time for a live demo.